All right. Well, you've already got the hint, I think, of the thrust of the message today. Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross. And it's a phrase that's worked its way into our society, uh, kind of as the uh, different form when people say we all have our cross to bear, right? Of course, you know, the, there are many hymns in our hymnal that have humorous titles, um, like uh, Lead On, Oh, Kinky Turtle. You've heard that one before? King Eternal, King Eternal, never mind. How about Gladly the Cross-Eyed Bear? Anybody? Gladly the Cross-Eyed Bear? Okay. Its name is Gladly, and he's a cross-eyed girl, bear. Okay. You're not awake yet. I tell you what. We'll see if that gets anything at the second service at all. No, Gladly the Cross-Eyed Bear is the hymn. Gladly? I don't see anything in here about gladly following Jesus. I know there are, it's in other places in the scripture. I'm not saying it's not there. Uh, but right here, we have a very scary invitation, a very somber invitation. If any want to become my followers, and it's conditional, there's an if. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, and take up their cross, and follow me. In the musical Sunset Boulevard, the collection agents are coming to get the car from our hero, the writer. And of course, he's long overdue on his car payments, and thereafter his keys. And they sing to him, are you telling us you walked here? And he sings, I believe in self-denial. I'm in training for the priesthood. Yeah. Okay, wise guy, give us the keys, they say. Are you in self-denial? We like to think that self-denial is a bad thing. You meet someone who's in denial and you say, oh, they're on that river in Egypt. Denial, right? Well, okay. Here, Jesus makes it sound like something we ought to do, to deny ourselves. We've turned self-denial into some sort of uh, slang, a derogatory term for someone who doesn't have a grasp on reality. Really, it's something much more special and meaningful and useful. How do we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow me? And what's this business about their cross? What do you mean our cross? Well, isn't the song beneath the cross of Jesus, I take my stand? Isn't our faith about Jesus' cross? Today we're going to talk a little bit about that. The way of the cross versus the way of grace, or cheap grace, and what the difference is. Talk a little bit about what our cross looks like, what it has to do with self-denial, but ultimately what it means to follow Jesus with a cross. So first, let's go back to that uh, bit about self-denial, to live in Denial, again, as I've said, means sort of a derogatory thing. To ignore reality. To say, oh, no, 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 I, I'm not going to believe that, no matter how true it may be. I'm not going to accept that, no matter how passionately you argue. I'm going to deny that that even exists. Denial. Or... We could flip it over and look at the other definition of denial, the other side that perhaps Jesus is getting at, denying themselves. In the case of being willful or being willing, you've heard me talk about this before. Uh, Gerald May, a psychotherapist, writes about the nature of being willful versus willing. It's useful and helpful stuff for Christians. In fact, he is himself a Christian author. And so what does it mean to be willing versus to be willful? To be willful is like to be full of yourself, to be full of your will, to say, this is how it's going to be. It's my way or the highway. You like it? Great. You don't? Tough? I'm not going to change. This is how it is. Willful. Think full of yourself, full of the will. On the other hand, willing is to say, oh, 
okay, I can go along with that. I can accept that. Sure, I'll help. Yes, I'll do this. You might think that one is the firmly planted, entrenched no, and the other is the open and ready yes. Where do you find self-denial in the good sense? In the stubborn willfulness or the open willingness? What does it take to go from one to the other? How does the heart change? We think of Pharaoh whose heart was hardened by God. We see in scripture those who act stubbornly against the Lord's will. We see it in Jonah who was willful when he said, I'm not going to Nineveh. Instead, I think I'll go off to Tarshish, like the Vegas of his day. I'm going to go have fun. I'm not going to go off and do what you want. And then finally he does. He becomes willing after spending three days in the belly of the fish. God subjects the willful to difficulties so that they might learn to be willing And after that struggle, he emerges from the fish, begrudgingly willing. Still, it's a crack. It's enough to turn from willful to willing. Begins to deny himself and follow God. And he goes to Nineveh, and he preaches the word, and lo and behold, the Ninevites repent. The word was repent, put on sackcloth and ashes. They did this. God relented. Nineveh was spared, and now Jonah put on his willful hat again and said, Hey, wait a minute. I wanted to see some destruction. God says, Sit down, Jonah. Jonah sits under the bush in his stubbornness. It's so hot, the bush is there. And the next day the worm comes and eats the bush, and Jonah's in the sun again. Is there no end of torment? for the willful. Now you might say, but wait a minute, I'm willing, and I feel torment too. Well, Jesus doesn't promise that it will absolutely be smooth sailing, easy peasy when you are willing. You know, in this world we have trouble. But the willful, by their willfulness, close themselves off to God's possibilities, are only open in a strange way to God's torment. The willing are open to all of God's possibilities. The joy and the pain, the opportunity that God presents. So, when we deny ourselves, when we set aside our own self, we open up to God's possibilities. Now, about that suffering. That brings us to this cross part. These little crosses that they give out are very sanitized, at least they're wood. We think of uh, beautiful golden crosses or silver crosses. We've seen fancy crosses carved out of bone. I have one made out of olive wood. We clean up our crosses. I've got a nice one made out of nails. If you turn it a certain way, it looks like Jesus hanging on it. It's pretty neat. But even that is very clean. No, and this cross as well. At least it's somewhat rugged. It's beautiful. I know some who worry about it falling on us while we're up here doing communion. <laughs> but no, it's, it's securely fastened. It's fine. The cross was an instrument of torture, an instrument of death. I've told you about the time, and I'll tell you again. I apologize if you've heard this story and didn't like it the first time. But about the time that uh, I spent on the cross in our passion play in college. We did a a passion play right in the middle of campus with our InterVarsity Christian Fellowship service group. Members of other uh, campus uh, ministry groups joined in. So it took a large crowd, a large cast, to make this work. And my uh, role was the thief on the cross who taunts Jesus. You say you're the Christ? Get us down from here. Save yourself and us. I mean, it was a short little part. The hard part of it was that we were actually up on full-sized wooden crosses that someone had made, and they'd used railroad spikes as the nails, because, I mean, they they really show up well. 
And we had to hold ourselves onto the nails, onto these spikes, like this. And to kind of hang there, holding onto those nails. And we had a little two by four, about a two inch by two inch, or is it inch and three quarters of two by four, for our heels to rest on. So heels on a little board, hands on a couple of nails, and wait. Wait while Jesus is flogged, while he carries his cross, while he stops, Simon the Cyrene picks up the cross, and they make their way across campus to the place where Jesus would be crucified. We have to wait while Jesus is nailed to the cross. And i got to tell you, the sound of a, a little tiny sledgehammer on those spikes was ringing around the campus. And our Jesus really played it up with a lot of yells. I mean, people were, yeah, it was moving. And then this Jesus is hoisted up, is stuck in the pre-prepared hole. And then we were told to wait a few minutes before the dialogue to let the impact of three people on crosses sink in. And then the dialogue, and then the response, and then Jesus had to die. I mean, it was a long time. Do you get the idea? My arms were shaking, my legs were shaking, my back was killing me, my gut was beginning to quiver. My body was doing things uncontrollably that I never didn't think it would do. Just being in that position, let alone without the pain of having actually been nailed to the thing. I don't know how people uh, survived being crucified. You? Do you get that? Are you with me now? It was not a pleasant ordeal, but I did it for the sake of the impact of the play, which it did have great impact. I was willing to do that work because I could remember the words of our staff member as he began to evangelize the crowd that had gathered to watch the play and to receive the souls who were willing to give their life to Christ that very moment. Such was the impact of the passion, of the power of the crucifixion. Now, is that literally what Jesus means? We should take up a, a cross and hang on it for a while? I know many of you have specialized exercise machines in your home. How many of you um, have a treadmill? I'm sorry. How many of you? Because how many of you have used yours about as often as we use ours? <laughs> Which is not much. All right. Good luck getting rid of it when the time comes. But how many of you actually love and use exercise equipment, whether it's a weight bench or something like that that's in your home? How many of you have a cross set up on your home somewhere that you hang on regularly? Anybody? No, we don't. Does Jesus mean that we are to have a literal cross that we carry around, like one that you wear on your chest or hang on your backpack? Is that what he means? Take up your cross. And how could they have understood? Let's be realistic here. This is... We're seeing this with our Jesus glasses on. We're looking back on this, knowing the result. This crowd, well, he had only just then begun to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. That was the, the opening shot there. The disciples had just begun to figure out that he was Messiah, but what did that mean? Just to clarify what Messiah meant, Jesus began to tell them about the suffering he must undergo and the death he must die. Does our self-denial and our cross-carrying lead to death? Does it lead to agony and suffering and pain? If you're expecting me to say no, I apologize, for it certainly leads to death. It certainly leads to agony and pain. It leads to suffering. But it leads to the blessed assurance that our suffering is not in vain, that our death is not for nothing, and that there is life on the other side of it. Our work of carrying our cross is joined with the transformative work of Jesus on his cross. Jesus paid it all. Jesus made it possible for any and all of us to receive the forgiveness of sins, but the call for us to join in carrying a cross. 
well, why should we have to do that if Jesus paid it all? Why should we have to be willing to deny ourselves? I like myself. I've got a whole shelf full of books telling me how much I ought to like myself and how to make myself a better self. I've seen those PBS specials, the ones that tell you how to be your best self. I've heard those TV preachers say, just work on being good. Be good to people. That's all you really have to do. Well, Jesus saves you, but be, be good to people. Be nice. You can do it. You can be self-empowered. How well does self-discipline really work? Even the gurus tell us that self-discipline works best when we have accountability with someone else to remind us. To ask the Dr. Phil question, how is that working for you? That self-discipline. When we find ourselves trying to do it our way, even if we don't sing the song, when we do it my way, when we do it our way, and we run into trouble, oh, but you need some accountability. You need someone to remind you. Or you need to set your running shoes next to the bed in the morning. That's the favorite trick, right? It's a good trick. But when we rely too much on our tricks, we rely too much on ourselves, we stop denying ourselves, and we set aside Jesus' cross. But when we can deny ourselves and be willing to let God into our lives to work, to endure some pain and suffering, ah, then our trajectory changes. Just like James speaks about the rudder of the ship, the tiny little thing. We don't need a giant cross in our homes that we hang on daily. Maybe all we need is a little bitty cross around our necks. I met a girl this week who had the ichthus uh, tattooed on her inside of her arm. There's some pain, I'm sure. I've never gotten a tattoo, but I understand it's some, there's some pain involved in getting a tattoo, depending on where you get it. I'm sure, that's a reminder. Pain is a useful teacher. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a tiny little cross that hangs on our backpack. It's a reminder that becomes our accountability that says, are you willing to let God lead you, or are you willful choosing your own path? Have you taken up your cross? Are you following Jesus? And lastly, what is your cross? Well, that's the question, isn't it? That's a big question. Let me give you some parameters to help you find your cross, if you're not sure what it is already. Your cross resembles Jesus' cross in some way. Your cross, the crosses that we bear, resemble Jesus' cross. I don't mean the shape, I mean the intent, the efficacy, that is how his cross worked. His cross led to death. Are you willing to die a little death? Does your cross lead to the death of self? Perhaps your cross may lead to the death of a relationship. Your cross may also lead to the death of a bad habit. Your cross may lead to all kinds of small little deaths that we die, as Luther says, we become little Christs with little crosses that follow a big God who died on a full-sized cross. The world wants to offer us cheap grace. And sometimes that cheap grace is disguised as self-help. Be careful. The Bible is full of plenty of advice to help us be better. Be good people. Be better people. To feel better about ourselves. We should have good self-esteem. But be careful that you don't cross into willfulness. It's our temptation. We all do it. We all sin. Look at the examples in Isaiah. The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I didn't hide my face from insult and spitting. Does that sound like willfulness or willingness? Willingness. Willingness to hear the tongue of the teacher in the morning. Willingness to know how to sustain the weary of the word. Isaiah sets a beautiful example of willingness. Jesus sets the ultimate as the suffering servant. When our cross looks like Jesus' cross, it's a cross of willingness to do the Father's work. Are you 
willing than your cross may be like Jesus' cross. And finally, is it something that you have to carry? Well, that sounds like, a, like an obvious thing, doesn't it? Two years we did the Passion Play. One year I was a thief on the cross. The next year I was Simon of Cyrene. and had to stop and pick up the cross. Or as those of us in our uh, little group called it, uh, the Jolly Green Simon. Uh, because the Simon's costume looked a lot like, ho, 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 green giant. I mean, it really, it had the little jaggedy edge and everything. If you were to wear green tights, you'd look just like the jolly green giant. So, but I had to stop and carry the cross. And I, honestly, after having portrayed the thief on the cross and enduring that and feeling that physical pain, didn't think that the role of Simon of Cyrene was going to be, hmm, all that. People are perplexed by Simon. People are perplexed by carrying the cross. I think there's first an assumption that's torn away, that the cross was already there, and they somehow put Jesus up on it and nailed him up on it like you do a picture on the wall. The mechanics of it first are a little confusing. But then the idea that Jesus had to carry his own cross. A lot of Catholics get that. They have the stations of the cross. They understand the carrying aspect but it's an eye-opener if you've never seen it. And then finally, that Jesus couldn't carry it. He was so weak from having been beaten. His body was giving way that they employed Simon to carry it. That the Romans could just grab somebody out of the crowd and make them be involved. Well, is he going to get crucified too? What's happening to him? Why, why is he doing that? Who is this guy? carrying the Savior's cross. The moment I got Simon of Cyrene is when we got to Golgotha and I laid it down and they put him on it instead of me. I carried his cross, but he died on it. What's your cross that you carry? It's a different story we think about our Savior's death versus the small death that we must die on the crosses that we're called to carry. Take up your cross. Take up your cross. Deny yourself. It's right there. But the most important part is the following. Follow Jesus. If you just say, well, I'm going to self just going to live in self-denial. I'm going to become an ascetic. I'm going to get rid of all my possessions. I'm going to move into a hermitage. I'm going to deny all worldly pleasures. And then I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to pour out my heart in service. I'm going to suffer. Well, there are a lot of Buddhists who do that. Do they follow Jesus? There are a lot of people who just decide that that's the way they want to live for whatever psychological reason floats their boat somehow. Are they following Christ? Follow Jesus. Your cross looks like Jesus' cross. When we follow Jesus, we find our way to the Savior's heart like no other way will take us. And the blessing that is there is beyond anything we can see or taste or touch in this world carry us through into the next. Amen.